Hello, and welcome to the Gifted Ed Podcast. We are your hosts, Angel Van Howe, Gifted Coordinator and SAL Facilitator. And Megan McCarthy, Social Worker. We are grateful for the opportunity to share this space with you today as we talk about the complexities of giftedness. Today is a special edition episode as it will feature a recording from our ACS Family Speaker Series. The Family Speaker Series is new this school year and its purpose is to provide support and education for families on a variety of topics that all relate to giftedness. Our January speaker was Nancy Parkinson. Nancy offers a wealth of information in teaching early literacy education, specifically focusing on dyslexia and executive functioning. This inspired her to open her very own private tutoring practice. She also recently joined the Avery Coonley School as a literacy specialist. Nancy's presentation explores concepts and evidence based in instructional models that help us understand the foundations of literacy. She'll expand on the pillars of reading called the Big Five. This includes phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Nancy also describes how cracks in the pillars impact literacy development, such as language delay, speech and hearing deficits, home language environment, executive functions, and dyslexia. Tonight, we are honored to have Nancy Parkinson as our guest speaker. Nancy Parkinson started her professional journey with a double major in elementary education and speech and language therapy. After working in medical speech pathology, Nancy discovered a love for helping the younger population with many diagnoses affecting motor speech, language, and cognitive challenges. Please join us in a warm welcome for Nancy Parkinson. Good evening, everyone. So tonight, we're just going to talk a little bit about improving early literacy And I'm really focusing mostly on the lowest ages, K through two-ish, three, four, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So for this period of time, I chose to break it down into these topics, a little talk about the foundations of literacy, some useful models and concepts, and then take a little bit of a deeper dive into what we call the big five people in reading know these big five, and we'll talk about them one by one as we go through the hour. And finally, a little bit about some factors that can interfere with the development of these skills. First of all, what is literacy? And the simple definition right out of the dictionary is a quality or state of being literate, especially the ability to read and write. And I just want to make the point that with regard to language, we have receptive language, which is what you you are taking in and understanding, and that can be listening and auditory. But then the other, the literacy side of that is the reading, taking in the visual code. And then on the expressive side, we have speaking, verbalizing, and the um, equivalent print angle to that is writing. So really, we should talk about reading and writing both with regard to literacy. And I will be trying to get some of the writing in. But the past couple of decades, a lot of focus has been given to the reading side of the coin. So there's a little more research on that. So the research, speaking of, has shown that Our brains are built for oral communication. They are built to handle auditory and uh, verbal expression, but they're not so much built for reading and writing. Reading and writing tend to be having to make more connections between centers of the brain. It's just a little uh, sketch to kind of illustrate that that you have to kind of get into all these areas and lobes of the brain and they have to make connections that are more complex than just listening and speaking. So this little clip is kind of a gratuitous nod to my darling grandchildren. It's to illustrate that the actual foundational skills begin far ahead of when children show up at school. And here we see a little 18-month-old with her book. So she's got the concept of turning the pages. She went a little too far. She's going to go back. Then you also have 
the same age child is beginning to try to imitate adults in the environment with the writing on the screen. And then we have two other adorable grandchildren. Big brother is trying to help coach little baby sister on how you read a book. So that's my gratuitous nod to grandkids for the night. We can advance. But really the point on that is this all begins right out of the womb practically. And uh, by the time we see kids in school, they've had a lot of years of building those foundational skills, hopefully. Um, the simple view of reading is one which was conceptualized by Goff and Tumner in 1986. And they proposed that reading has to take into account both decoding, breaking down the letters of the words, and language comprehension. So you can't just read the words and get really good at that. You have to have had the language base behind it and ahead of it, really, and then continuing to understand what you're reading. I think that makes sense to most of us. A little while later, um, this is Hollis Scarborough's model, and she wanted to propose that reading is much more complicated than just listening comprehension times decoding. So her listening comprehension is at the top and she wants to um, include background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, which are syntax and semantics, uh, verbal reasoning, you see there inference, metaphor, et cetera, literacy knowledge, print concepts, genres, et cetera. And then the bottom strands are representing the word recognition or decoding piece. Phonological awareness has to go into that. We'll talk more about that. Decoding and some sight recognition of familiar words. And you begin to bring any words that you get automatically memorized in your brain are going to become sight words. And that's what eventually feeds good reading comprehension and fluency. Just recently, another researcher, teacher, educator decided that we have to look at writing in the same light. And she devised her writing rope. And you can see that some of these elements really are flip sides of what we saw in the reading rope. And you have to include, and actually they have a big five on this rope too, the critical thinking, syntax, text structure, writing craft, transcription. Transcription at the bottom is probably the closest to spelling. Well, it includes spelling closest to decoding, flip side of that. Um, but all of these strands in both these ropes, it's just to make the analogy that if any one of them is weak, that is going to weaken the whole rope, which you can kind of conceptualize yourself. Um, Another model that is what we're going to use as kind of our guide tonight is the five pillars of reading. This came out of the National Reading Panel in 2000, did meta-analysis of many studies and tried to pinpoint uh, correlations between skills and then give them labels. And they came up with these five, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. You've seen some of those in the rope and we're going to go on and take them one by one with some uh, comments. So phonemic awareness refers to sounds, not letters, but the sounds. And it begins well before children are able to handle letters and the alphabet. So when they hear, when you hear the word cat, in your brain, it has to be processed as separate sounds that are then blended together. K -a -t. And you can see that um, and the next example down is chat. And that word has three sounds as well. Ch -a -t. But we know that we have to differentiate that ch sound in some way from the and our English language has so many sounds over and above the number of letters we have available that we have had to devise some combinations to stand in for sounds 
that don't have their own symbol. So we'll practice with little children or even just beginning readers, and actually as they go further as well, how many sounds are you hearing in this word? And get them used to trying to separate out what they're hearing in the word. The On the left, you have a picture of uh, this is supposed to represent trash, and you would be working with them to hear t, r, a, sh. And the boxes below give them an anchor on which to place the sound. Eventually, now, very soon, that's going to um, help them determine letters that would go with each sound and how many letters do they need. We can use this without letters, but generally we move very quickly into attaching letters. In the bottom right is another early activity, differentiating vowel sounds in the word. Uh, there's two columns there with pictures. One is for short A as in cat, short E as in bed, and you might give the child a lot of pictures to pronounce the word and decide what they're hearing, the a ah or the a. Ah. So that's really basically phonemic awareness. It gets more complex as they, uh, the vocabulary gets more complex and multisyllabic words. But now we'll move into phonics in the five pillars. In phonics, we're mapping these sounds to the letters. So in, as we said before, in our example of at, we'll be training kids to attach a letter formation to a sound. Um, we know, again, there are 44 sounds and 26 letters. Some single sounds are represented by more than one letter, like our ch with ch. And there are other letters that can stand for more than one sound like uh, the letter A. Here's just a quick little highlight. So this table is the International Phonetic Alphabet, and that alphabet does have a separate symbol for every sound, but we don't use all of these in English, so you'll see the highlight showing three different sounds that are represented by letter A, ah uh, and ah, uh, and the schwa sound, uh. So this all goes into teaching the phonics, the beginning stages. You might have very tactile materials to help kids with their tactile kinesthetic cues. We know that the brain learns more and solidifies more information the more senses are used. And so we can exploit that by using uh, materials that can be touched. And in the second picture, you're just seeing those boxes again, but this shows you that uh, for some of these vowel sounds that require two letters and other sounds as well, you'll have one box and you're helping them to determine actually in this activity, they have a larger box and that could kind of cue them that that's going to be more than one letter. On the very lower right, we can use a whole paper of these boxes and teach kids to put a dot down for every sound they're hearing and then go back and map a letter form for each sound. And it really can help them improve their spelling. A little word about fluency, the next of the pillars. This definition or uh, mnemonic is from the mega book of fluency by Tim Rosinski and Melissa Cheeseman Smith. And they like to use the ears mnemonic expression, uh, meaning this all goes into fluency. Expression, automaticity, which means you're looking at a word and you can automatically pronounce it. That comes after practice. Some kids, it happens very quickly. Others need a lot more practice, a lot more exposures to each individual word. Uh, rhythm and smoothness or self-correction at times, they'll say. And in simple terms, you could think of fluency is speed with accuracy and expression. So we don't want them to try to read too quickly so that they're making lots of errors because obviously then the comprehension will suffer. These are some fluency activities. In every level, when you are uh, teaching a new 
sound combination, letter sound, phoneme, grapheme, matching. Phoneme is the smallest unit of sound in our language, like the a or the ch. And a grapheme is the letter form that you associate with the phoneme. So you may have the student go through and, as it said, read these sounds. And you're really trying to get faster at doing it. And, uh, Thr, a, bl, a, ing, ch, al, t, i, j. And you can actually chart this and have them do it the next day and the next day or several times in a day. And it can be very motivating that they see that they are getting quicker. And really, they're rewiring their brain. They're making the brain send the signals quicker and quicker, as we do with any practice, you know, a tennis swing or when we all learn to drive a car, et cetera. So you can start really at the sound level. We often go into nonsense words, we call it. And these are combinations that are close to a real word. They might have a phonetic pattern that a real word could have, but we're taking out the ability for them to guess the word. Many kids do get to a um, habit of seeing the first one or two letters and guessing the word. I'll say more on that later. So to really try to train them out of that, you can use these kinds of non-words. Plin, dith, flen, tunch, das, etc. And then you increase your level to phrases. And I had I actually had a group today that I was trying to get them more fluent just with a phrase because they tend to read word by word, trying to preserve accuracy on the bed. And I had them go through the three word phrases and say it first that way and then say on the bed. Uh, By the way, all the time modeling this for them. The other point about this is that you can then move into helping them say it silently in their more separated fashion. And I'll say, say it in your head that way When you're ready to say the whole thing, then say the whole phrase. And they got better within minutes on that. And then you can use this, by the way, is the scooping that is used in OG and Wilson reading instruction, trying to help them visualize the chunks that are phrases. And you're going to help them see the second one is an example that you can be flexible. The cat is on the bed, or the cat is on the bed. We will run to catch the bus, etc. And you'll move into scooping a whole story, as you can see. The next thing would be to present that story without the scoops and help them see that they're now reading more fluently. So now this is um, a good time to talk about leveled books versus decodables. So some of uh, the leveled books are, these are just commercial examples that you might pick up in a bookstore. So on the left is Rocket the Brave. It's a cute story about a dog who's learning to read, but this is supposed to be the very first step for a child just learning to read. And it might be a four-year-old and you see the sentence, the butterfly flies away. Well, butterfly is a three-syllable word It's a compound word. Um, It has some very advanced vowel patterns with the ER and the Y saying I. And then flies is an inflected verb. They have to know why change to I and add ES, et cetera. And the one on the right is from, again, a level one beginning reader. And we've got museum and director and dinosaur and comfortable. Well, I guess we can all realize that when the kids are reading these, they're really memorizing. They're going to memorize the word pattern, and they might begin to memorize a few of those individual words, but they're not building their strategy, and they're not building the pathways in the brain to help them access new words that are in similar patterns. Um, Next slide. And this is just another example. This is from Um, reading A to Z, 
and they have a leveling system of alphabetical letters. Fontas and Pinnell is on the right. They also use the letters. Lexile, actually, they do um, take into account some sentence length and syntax. But my whole point in showing this is, let's just look at an example. Level A kindergarten. Next slide will show us a level A book, and it's called Make a Salad. And here are the words to know in the box up on the right. Add, well, that's okay, not so bad. Beets, carrots, cheese, dressing, lettuce, onions, peppers, tomatoes. Do you see any patterns that are similar? I don't know what we're teaching beyond really memorizing because you have add the lettuce and you see the girl. Once you learn add the, you're really just trying to um, identify the picture and memorize that word which isn't going to train you for further reading of similar patterns. This is actually a great YouTube that illustrates even better what a leveled book um, is or is not teaching. And it's called The Purple Challenge. The um, creator of that video uh, describes herself as a behavioral scientist, so I'm not really sure if she's a psychologist or something else, but she had a first grade daughter who was being taught with leveled books. And she kind of thought there were some glitches that it wasn't really sticking. So she did an experiment and she managed the variables as scientists do. And she was able to determine that the girl was really memorizing using picture cues and when she then, mom showed her the words by themselves or the phrases or sentences, the child couldn't read them or very few, not nearly as many as when she was looking at the pictures. Um, so I encourage you in, in your handouts or if you get a handout, that YouTube reference is there. It's very enlightening. This is the other kind of book called a decodable book. Um, we have what you're really looking at are a book that includes patterns in the words that the child is being taught to decode. When you've had the concept of most of the consonant sounds and some short vowels and practiced these words like dot and dog and Dan and man. Now, you still will want to teach some of the high frequency words earlier than you can teach all the phonics for them. There are ways to do that. And we can actually fold in a little bit of phonics, but explain, for instance, in teaching the TH is the sound th, and the E is an unexpected sound. And you uh, one way is we put a little heart over it and say, you just need to know that part by heart. But um, a few of those go a long way to helping to expand what you can use in these kinds of books at a lower age level without um, relying on memorizing whole sentences. This one actually is from flyleafpublishing.com, which has a great website. Parents can access it for free. Every book they have contains a lot of um, information about what words are targeted, what patterns, and even for some of them, it gives a whole plan, learning plan for what you can do with that book, which is helpful if you're trying to help your child. Just another example of a flyleaf book. This one is nonfiction, a little further along in level. So you'll see the digraph ng spelled NG and also the um, higher level patterns and multi-syllable words. So it sounds like I was bashing leveled books, but can we ever use them? Yes. There are some great, interesting books uh, that kids really want to read. And you can certainly use them for read alouds to your child and you're building the language comprehension some syntax, some vocabulary, and that's all going to be helpful in the end. We just don't want to have a child struggle through reading or be reduced to guessing words, using just the picture to make up the story. 
when they're at the age where they should be learning how to decode the words. So for independent reading, they are recommended only when they've met some of these criteria to be able to decode the CVC words, as I mentioned before, a few of the one to three syllable with these simple graphemes. Also a little bit of understanding of what a schwa is, that it's any vowel letter in a multi-syllable word that doesn't get a full sound and it really comes out sounding like i or a. Uh. So they have to spend some time learning about that and decoding other kinds of syllables, a long vowel with a silent e on the end, like the word ride or um, like or cake. And our controlled vowels, which are the A-R, E-R, U-R, I-R, O-R. And the presence of the R right after a vowel just changes the sound of the vowel. So you have to teach that explicitly as well. So we're into the fourth pillar vocabulary. So all of this is true. Better oral vocabulary equals better reading. And that's, you know, I think we all know that intuitively, build the vocabulary before they're even reading and always explain, don't don't make everything a, a talking down, uh, play audiobooks, documentary films of high interest will help build the vocabulary, playing word games, use your big words, encourage your children to search out the words that they aren't quite sure about. And for that, I like to have a real handheld dictionary and you need to revisit these, review. They need depth and breadth of vocabulary as they um, increase in their reading life. I think just a few pictures, you know, these kinds of games. Kids enjoy anything in a game. And it also fits, um, the research shows that things are apt to stick if you're having fun with it and your emotional outlook is positive and happy. So games are great. And these are some examples of dictionaries. The one in the middle, I have had all these three, and the kids I work with constantly go back to the middle one, this Merriam-Webster. The photographs are great. They sometimes just want to do too much. It reminds me of old days when we had encyclopedias in the house, and some kids would really get into down a rabbit hole looking at different things in the encyclopedia. Um, you can help children too by building their own personal vocabulary binder. There are lots of different ways to organize it. This is just one example. Um, you can write the word in the center top, synonym and antonym, definition, sentence, or even a picture. A lot of kids like to draw a picture of what they have learned about that word. Um, on to comprehension. So, so many things go into comprehension, and you can recall from the reading rope, many of these items relate to some of the things we saw in the reading rope. You want to help guide the child for recall and retell part by part. It's very helpful for some with working memory issues, perhaps, especially to encourage them to stop after a nice size chunk like a paragraph or a page and recap what they just got from that part of the story. Identify the main idea in details. Uh, sequence the events from after you've done, and that's part of recall and retell actually. You can look for a problem and solution. You should always encourage answering questions with evidence from the text help them learn to make inferences so they will read something. And if they connect it to something they already know, they can kind of guess what was the person feeling or what might happen next, connect information with other experiences or books and make predictions. A lot of these are a little redundant. Connecting information that they already know or their experiences is really important. Um, it falls under background knowledge. And what we have found is many kids reading comprehension suffer simply because they don't have 
any frame of reference for a subject that they're reading about. So we try to help build that up first, or at least suss out whether they do have some background information. Now, another example of a decodable, this one is more complex, Mr. Molstow, um, and you can see the text is a little more advanced. Um, this was, I was referring earlier to this company does give a lot of good information for parents how to work on comprehension within the context of a decodable book. So a lot of times that's been a big complaint. Well, decodables aren't that interesting. And how can I even think of comprehension um, activities when it's just this simple story? Well, even the earliest story I showed you, the Don and Dan, has a way to do that. But um, the bottom line is, over the past 10 years especially, this industry has gotten better and better at creating decodables that actually have more story to them, more meat on the bones, and vocabulary is included in that. So some of the things that can interfere, present interference in these pillars or the strands, language delay, that's obvious, the whole upper part of the rope, language comprehension. Speech and hearing deficits can interfere on many levels. Sometimes when children have a, an articulation deficit, they will be pronouncing a word in, incorrectly, and they have trouble then mapping the sound to the grapheme. Um, many children who retain the F or V sound for the TH sound will, for a long time, spell they or the with V or F. Um, so that can get in the way. The home language environment, if it's a second language or if um, there aren't good role models for adults in the home um, interested in literacy and doing their own reading and writing, that can harm the development of literacy for the child. Executive functions include um, memory, working memory, attention. The executive functions also involve the social emotional aspect. And if a child has had some trouble, it's kind of a vicious cycle. They become more resistant because who likes to do things that you can't do well? We hopefully help to guide them that they can get better and start at a very small bit and show them how they can improve uh, small pieces and encourage them to go forward, but that can have a detrimental effect on um, reading and writing. Uh, dyslexia is a big one. I think most people, well, we'll get to the definition. And then COVID-19 is another recent one. So here's the definition of dyslexia that's been commonly adopted. It's neurobiological in origin characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. And by the way, with many disorders, these areas can be more or less impacted and someone might show much more of a spelling difficulty than the reading. They might have learned a lot of words by heart but not have understood the uh, phoneme graphing mapping and then their spelling is really falling apart. And sometimes they also have a lot more difficulty as they get to older grades uh, for that same reason. If we can't memorize every word that's in our language, obviously. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. It really is all based on the auditory to begin with. Um, and that difficulty is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities, perhaps in math, perhaps in other um, oral language, their actual conversational speech, in the presence of having had good, solid classroom instruction. And then this is what I mentioned a minute ago, that that can lead to reduced experience of reading because you're avoiding or resistant to be faced with something that's hard for you. And perhaps a lot of kids too are very sensitive to 
recognizing maybe how quickly and how well their peers in the classroom are reading and they feel even less apt to want to um, expose their own lesser ability. Um, we have mounting evidence over, you can see that's from 2004, and this evidence has been building up for at least 30 years. Brain studies show that children who were struggling readers did show increased activation where typical and proficient readers show more activity after they've been instructed in good explicit ways. Um, incidence of dyslexia, most sources state it's 10 to 20% of the population just in general, including gifted 2E population, not unheard of at all for dyslexia. Um, these are common myths. You may have heard that it's a visual disorder. What we know is that's not uncommon in all kids to do, uh, especially early on. Now, it might hang on more for certain kids with more difficulty. Uh, boys are not more likely to demonstrate dyslexia. It is not due to laziness or low intelligence. Uh, laziness sometimes is alluded to because of what I already mentioned, resisting doing the thing that makes you feel terrible and you feel bad about. Did COVID-19 affect learning to read and write? Yes, it did. We know that it did. Um, and if you think back to one of the previous slides, that it is a phonologically based disorder and a language based disorder, the mitigation factors of um, well, some outright closures of schools, so just losing time in the calendar, the interface of using Zoom and digital um, classroom, the um, masking, if you did, were fortunate to have a school that was able to stay open as ACS was, you still have a barrier to hearing speech correctly and even seeing the speech motion on the mouth, which also helps connect to the listener's brain, as we know, speech reading. Um, are we making progress? Yes. But we have learned um, this study that's referred to was just published in December, and it was the organization that develops the MAP testing, which you might be familiar with. They collected a lot of data and showed that the most affected are the current third graders who were in kindergarten when pandemic began and that um, in trying to project the closing the gap, they feel like it's going to take a few years. Hopefully we can facilitate a quicker um, recovery. These are some of the main things we know we should do and could do use evidence-based scope and sequence. And to that effect, at your school, you've adopted a very um, science-based reading curriculum for the youngest grades called Reading Horizons. And so that's being done. That does That is proven to be helpful. We give direct explicit instruction. Don't assume anything. You scaffold the instruction with gradual release of support. And that means essentially you show exactly what you expect the child to do or say. Then you do it together. Sometimes this is called I do, we do, you do. I do first. Then we do it together or read it together. Then, and you might do that several times over and over. And then release support or release responsibility to the child for trying to do the task independently. Um, spiral review always, always review. Hands-on materials that brings in tactile uh, sensory input. Emphasize speech as the starting point. I think we talked about um, the good programs do include both the code itself, the printed material and starting from print, decoding the words to read, but then also starting from just um, spoken word and trying to encode into spelled words. And 
though spelling is a great multisensory task, and the spelling and phonics should always be linked so that what a child is learning in phonics, they are also then turning around and writing. And the closer the linking, the evidence has shown, the better and quicker the child is reading. So when we're teaching in this evidence-based fashion, we really want to kind of at least phase out the memorized spelling list, sending home and memorize the spelling of these 10, 20 words. What you really want to do is teach a pattern And ideally, you wouldn't even test individual certain words that were sent home for practice, but you would pick randomly other words that are the same pattern. Then you would know if they really are getting the pattern and not just memorizing sequence of letters. I mentioned math concepts because sometimes this makes it clearer. You would not send home a set of 10 addition and subtraction problems, and then have children come back and have the test be just those problems. Now, early on, you might say, well, math facts, you know, and times tables. That is true, but that's more like phoneme, grapheme, mapping, learning letter sound combinations. But the actual spelling of words involves applying patterns and principles And for that, you really should be just seeing if they know new words instead of just the memorized list. Okay, some examples of really great um, resource books for parents. And these are in the list, but these are some of the biggest uh, winners in my book. Uncovering the Logic of English, Common Sense Approach to Reading, Spelling, and Literacy, Speech to Print, Language Essentials for Teachers, it's a good resource for parents. Beneath the surface of words is the, um, well, you can see what English spelling reveals and why it matters. So we know all of this works. Research has been mounting for decades. And I also wanted to make a plug. This book, Fantastic Elastic Brain, is a great resource for helping kids get on board and understand that they have some control in expanding their brain pathways and synapses. So um, that's a good one to pick up if you've never seen it before. This is a great website for parents. There's a link right there for it too. This is University of Florida Literacy Institute. They have such explicit lessons and activities for parents. You can kind of zero in on where you think your child's having trouble Or you can ask the teacher for advice on that and look up some of these sections that will give you a wealth of material to work on. Well, thanks for listening. And I I'm probably was sort of pressing forward way too quickly. And I hope it (laughs) didn't seem like a mad dash. Once again, we would like to thank Nancy Parkinson for sharing this space with us today and offering her wealth of knowledge. If you would like to see the slideshow from the speaker series this evening, please see the link included in our show notes, along with resources that were mentioned during the presentation. Please subscribe to the Gifted Ed podcast to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode that continues to unpack the complexities of giftedness. 